Hey, what's up guys? It's Clint Coons here. And in this video, we're going to talk about working with private investors to fund your real estate deals. Okay, let's get started. All right, so here's the deal. You don't want to work with traditional lenders. Interest rates are up. You're finding it harder to put together financing packages. So what are you going to do? Maybe you go out there and you start working with private investors, people who are willing to invest in your deals. Now, the thing about working with private investors always comes down to how are you going to structure the deal with that investor? Some people just want interest and that's pretty simple, right? You just structure it as a loan. Some people want to own a piece of the deal. That is when the property sells, they want to get paid a percentage of the profits. So this is where it can get complicated in structuring these types of deals. And I've seen a lot of people screw this up before, not only on the lender side, but also on the developer or the person who's managing the, the uh, project. And it ends up in litigation and people are suing and the only people that are winning in that scenario are people like me, the attorneys who are representing both parties and they're just sitting there billing the time. At the end of the day, both individuals walk away from the table with no recovery. So what do you wanna do? You wanna use sound business practices to put these deals together to make sure that it's meeting the expectations of each party, but at the same time, not putting anyone at an exceptional risk or hampering the ability of the investor to move their deal forward. So I'm gonna go through four scenarios for you that you should consider when you're putting together a deal with a private investor who wants to come in and help fund your project. And I'm gonna do them, as I would say, in order of preference. This is the way that I like to put deals together for my clients. All right, so here's the first one. The first way you want to do uh, a deal when working with a private investor uh, investor would be to use a deed, okay, uh, of trust. All right. So what that means is that you're going to bring someone in. Let's say we got this property right here, and I want to bring in an investor, and they're going to bring in, uh, let's say, two hundred thousand dollars to help put this deal together. Now, in a lot of scenarios, people think about a JV, and, and I will get to that. But I think it's simpler and cleaner and, and more beneficial for the investor and the person over here who's managing this project, who's putting the deal together, to structure it as straight debt. Just treat this person as a lender. And when you borrow the money from them to put your, your deal together, give them back a secured interest in that property. So what does that look like? Well, if they're the only one funding the deal, that's going to be a deed of trust right here. They're going to get back a deed of trust. So if they send you $200,000, you have a promissory note to pay them back 200 grand with this deed of trust. Now, I understand as we talked about that some people want more than just interest. They want to own a piece of this deal. What they're looking for is a piece of the profit. So then how do you structure this, this structure here? Okay, use the word twice so that they get paid a piece when the property sells. Well, that comes down to your promissory note. So when I enter into a loan agreement with this, this lender, I'm going to have interest in there. And then I'm going to have another type of interest on top of that. It's called contingent interest. And what is contingent interest? Well, just this, that it's contingent upon the sale of the property. So this individual here, they get paid 20% of the profits on the sale of the property or 30% of the profits on the sale of the property. And you define that out in your promissory note. So now this lender knows, hey, I'm getting a 1% return on my money as the standard interest or 2.5%. Right, you gotta be careful there on what the interest rates are. And then I'm gonna get contingent interest on the sale. So now they're in for a piece, they have a secured interest in the deal, right? So they know they're gonna get paid. And this is what how you entice people to come work for you or loan you money or come into your deals. It's like, listen, you, you really don't have any risk here other than if I decide to bulldoze the property down and screw it up. But other than that, which you would never say, uh, is that you are a lender, therefore you're secured in the underlying asset. So I can't sell it without you getting notified and without you getting paid. Now, I like that type of structure. However, the problem is, is that this person here may not be the first because you might have a, a first position here uh, already with, with a lender. And maybe that, that lender prohibits you from borrowing any additional money or granting any other security interest. That's what we did there with that deed of trust against the property. Oh, so what do we, what do we do now in that scenario where I know I, I, I can't grant another security interest against it, but again, 
I want to bring this person into the deal and I want them to feel comfortable. So number two is to file a memorandum of interest. Okay, so you want to file a memorandum of interest uh, against the property. So back to that ex another example again. We got the individual there. This is the lender. All right, this is you if you're the one doing the deal. So you're going to loan money against this asset here, but rather than record a deed of trust, okay, which is going to show up against the property as a secured interest on the property, if someone were to look, you file what's called a memorandum of interest. Now the memorandum of interest is really pretty nebulous, okay, when it gets filed against a property. All it's doing is this, alerting anybody that ever pulls title, if you try, if, if, when I sell the property that, hey, there's another party out there that has some interest in this deal. What that interest is, they don't necessarily know until they contact this party right here. So again, what we would do is we would put together a promissory note, an agreement to borrow money, and in exchange for that as collateral, we'll allow them to file this memorandum of interest against the property. So when the property is sold, if we went back and used my first example, where you get 30% on the sale of the property, this individual here would tell, you know, title, hey, listen, I'm owed 30% on the profits. Here's how it's calculated. This is what I'm uh, owed out of the deal. Because you guys are going to be talking, right, uh, back and forth. And so then they'll, they'll, they'll send that over. They're going to check with you. You're going to say, yes, that is correct. And so then they'll get paid out of escrow when uh, that property closes. But that first position lender now, you agreed not to encumber the property with any other uh, creditors. I'm not encumbering the property. There's no deed of trust or mortgage that was recorded against the property. So this is a way for me to sidestep, work around those lenders who want to be the only person in play. And believe me, there are a lot of them out there because of the fact that they don't want to deal with junior mortgages if they had to foreclose. And so this is one of the reasons why they prohibit you from bringing on any other secured parties into uh, on that particular piece of property. Okay, so that's the second uh, step. Now, let's say that the person you're working with just isn't comfortable, doesn't want to be a lender, they want to feel like they have more skin in the game, they have more protection. Then the third option that you have that I would look at is what's called a TIC or a Tenant in Common Agreement. Now, I got a great video discussing Tenant in Common Agreements, and I have another video that um, um, release that discusses the important provisions that need to be in a tenant and common agreement. Now, I'm not going to go into those here, but be sure to check the show notes. I've got links to those videos there if you're interested in a uh, tenant and common agreement because you're thinking, hey, that's for me. That's what I'm going to be able to do to fund my deals. Check that out. Tenant and common agreement. What does that mean? It means that they're essentially an owner in the property. That's, that's what they are. So when you put your deal together now and you're going to go in on this, this property, you've got Tenant in common, this is me, the investor, and this is the party I'm bringing into the deal. We'll call them silent party because they're not going to be doing anything other than bringing to the table money. Now, title, okay? In these two, number one and number two, title would be held in your limited liability company. That's how title would be held. You'd be in full control of the property. In this scenario, title is going to be split. Title will be held in you know, I have you here, but actually it's going to be in your LLC. And then whoever this party, however they want to hold their title, maybe it's their individual name, maybe it's an LLC. My recommendation is tell them to set up a limited liability company to hold their interest because you don't know what's going on in their life, what type of challenges they face, lawsuits. You just don't want to get tied up in another person's problems. So um, I would have them come in as an LLC as well. But in this scenario now, you set up this tick agreement or, or this tenant common relationship. And if you watch my videos, you'll hear me talk about this. You wanna make sure that you're in control. So you file the TIC agreement, you record against a property that states, hey, you know, in my case, Clint's in control of the deal. Uh, silent partner over here, they have nothing to say about it. I control everything. So you would set that up so you can do the deal and rehab the property, flip it, whatever, whatever the intent is here. And then when the property's sold, if this was a, a say a 60-40 structure, a little different than what we had last time, 60-40 structure, then 60% of the profits, and that's actually recorded against the property. It would say, you know, Clint owns 60% and John as to his 40% tenants in common. John would get 40%, he signs off at closing, I get 60%, I sign off at closing, and that's how the money get it would be split. So 
it's a great way to, to set it up if, if one or two doesn't work, but the drawback to the tenant and common agreement, that's why I have it at number three, is you're actually bringing on somebody else as a partial owner in that deal. And you have, you know, it, it complicates things, right? If you want to sell, well, potentially they could try to block the sale, even though you can draft around that, it's an issue. So that's why I put it at number three. All right, so what is the fourth way if you're going out there to find money for your deals to put it together? Well, the fourth structure that you could look at is called a joint venture. All right, and if you're gonna do a joint venture, you're always going to use a limited liability company. So I'm gonna set it, call this a joint venture LLC. And what we're gonna do here is we're actually, we're gonna set up a limited liability company just like this. I'm gonna be here as one of the partners and then you're gonna have the other individual over here. We're gonna come in and if it's, again, like using the last example, it's 60, 40, we got 60 here, 40 here, properties owned in the name of the limited liability company. Now, when you set up a joint venture LLC, of course you wanna be in control. So this would be a manager managed, manager managed LLC with you as the manager, because if you're the property, I mean, this is your deal, you wanna control it, you're the one that has the expertise here. You don't want this guy interfering with what's going on. You're like, thank you for the money, you, you, you trust my expertise, sit back, shut up basically, and wait for me to do what I need to do, and then, then we'll split the prof, uh, profits from there. So here's the complexity or the problem with going the joint venture route with using the limited liability company is that if you're the manager and I'm a member in this LLC, I'm relying upon you to do everything. And therefore you have a fiduciary relationship or obligation to me. And this is where things can get sticky is that this JV member, if for whatever reason they decide to uh, start throwing some glue into the mix, they can do that as the fact that they're a member. So now they can proceed against your company and start creating problems for that joint venture and what's going on. I've seen this happen before where you've had people come into JVs, they're not experienced in real estate investing. They don't understand what you have to go through for feasibility and permitting and all of that. And they're complaining about the time. They just want their money back now because they don't think it's going to work out. And so now they start bringing uh, lawsuits against the LLC. They, they screw up the project, they halt the project. You can't move forwards and everyone loses money in that type of deal. So you've put them in a position now where they're able to step in and start causing problems. And unfortunately, that's just the way limited liability companies work. It's very difficult to draft around that. I mean, you could try to come up with two classes of interest, give them a second class of interest in that LLC but inevitably they say that those members, you have an obligation to them if you're the one that's in control to meet certain fiduciary standards. And that's where joint venture LLCs can create problems and slow the overall development down. That's why I put it at number four. A lot of people use them in their, in their deal structuring. I've, I've set them up myself, but it always comes down to, hey, make sure that you're not violating any expectations. Um, I've got some great videos on joint venture limited liability companies. Just search my YouTube channel uh, for that. You'll be able to watch those videos if you're considering going that route. Hey, if you like this video, hit the like button for sure. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. Take care, everyone.